Good afternoon, everybody. Uneducated economist here. I got the Lynette Zhang with me. So happy to have you on my show today, Lynette. I am excited to talk with you. Lynette, please do us a favor. Introduce ITM Trading. Let us know a little bit about who you are and what you do, and we'll get started with our conversation. Okay. First of all, Simon, I'm always happy to be with you. You are definitely one of my favorite people, and I'm always happy when we meet up in person. That's always a lot of fun for me. So I am Lynette Zhang. I've been in this industry on all different levels since 1964 when I was about 10 years old. Uh, ITM trading, I came to ITM in actually 2002 after the technical formulas confirmed that we were at the end of this currency's life cycle. So I've been studying currency life cycles uh, and started as a stockbroker in uh, 1987. That's why I started studying currency life cycles. And, you know, they're always the same. So I came to ITM Trading, which is a full service physical gold and silver dealer, meaning that if you order from us, unless you do this inside of an IRA, you will take physical possession, which personally is the only way that I think you should do it. Because if you don't hold it, you don't own it. But Really what makes us different is based on those studies, I developed a strategy for myself uh, that is just about repeatable patterns because we have over 4,800 times where currencies have outlived their uh, usefulness and their life cycle. So we have lots of data and lots of repeatable patterns. And what makes ITM unique is we've taken my basic strategy and with all the brilliance around us, we have a lot of brilliance here, uh, we've made it even better. And so we do what we prefer to do is customize strategies based on client goals, circumstance, and what they have to work with so that they cannot just survive the transition that we're in, but dare I say it, even thrive through it and come out the other side of it better than, than when they entered it. So everything is physical, but there's also a plan and it's a long-term relationship. So you know how to use your metals, when to use your metals, and we're keen on education. So that's who we are. Very cool. Thank you, Lynette. Um, you know, we talk about currency life cycles, and that's really hard for a lot of people who don't study yes. the economy, study macroeconomics, or just even understand monetary policy. You know, we kind of just grow up, we have these dollar bills in our hand, and we don't really think much about it. What exactly is a currency cycle? Like, we transfer from gold to to a fiat, and then may even go into what this might be central bank digital currencies. Like, what is going on here? Why are these cycles happening? Like, what is it that is a cycle inside of the currency? Maybe explain like gold transition to fiat transition to what might be next. Yeah, that's a great question, Simon. And thank you for asking that because, you know, there are a lot of very brilliant people out there and they talk about the markets like, like what's happening right now. Right, right now is just sort of kind of normal. I mean, we are getting a lot of the unusual pieces, but the reason why these everything seems so cattywampus is like everything else, there is a cycle. In other words, or as example, my, my granddaughter is turning nine. Well, I can tell you, she is at a different point in her life cycle at nine years old than I am today at 68 years old. And everything, I don't care what it is, everything has a life cycle. So when we were on the gold standard, what we were sold and what we needed was um, a way to, to value different functions and enable a society to specialize. So you can have a baker, you can have a banker, you can have a lawyer, you can have a farmer. And we needed a tool to value that labor. Gold, that lots and lots of things have been tried over the years, but gold is the only commodity, and it is a commodity-based currency, that actually fulfills the original four functions of money, which is a, a tool of measure, a tool of barter, 
a short-term store of value so that you're fairly paid for your labor today and a long-term store of value so that no matter when you use that money, you are always fairly paid for your labor. Now with a commodity money like gold and silver, well, that takes labor and energy to pull out of the ground and then mint it, et cetera. So you're really trading your labor for somebody else's labor. But if a government wants to tax you, it's obvious, you know about it and you might not agree to it. So they transitioned the system into fiat and fiat is the uh, definition is by decree, which means that it is a government legalized money. And they knew that not one man in a million understands inflation, but inflation was a key component of the new fiat currency. Now they keep the name the same so you don't realize anything has changed. But the reason why they wanted inflation baked in there for governments, the inflation tax is a way to tax you without having to go through legislation and make it visible. For corporations, they wanted to pay you less. But if you're used to getting 10 bucks an hour, you're not going to settle for five. If, however, inflation can make that 10 bucks spend like five, well, now you're actually agreeing to work for less, but you don't even realize it. So as an example of that piece, because it causes nominal confusion, but as an example of that piece, the average wage in 1971 was roughly $9,500. And a family of four could live on that. I'm not saying they were super loaded, but they only needed one wage earner to support that family of four. Today, the average wage is something like 57,000 and it takes two wage earners. You're still paycheck to paycheck. And let us not forget the stimulus that they gave you, what you had to be made, you could be making 150,000 or less. So you've got to understand that while you would say, well, I'd much rather have 57,000 than 9,500, what that currency would buy in 1971 could support a family of four. Today, that can't support barely anything. I mean, you are paycheck to paycheck and you require two wage earners. So uh, what they knew is that two, two key things, they knew more than this, but two key things. Number one, people marry the legal money of the state. So whenever they're making these transitions like we're in right now, they want to keep things looking as normal as possible, okay? And number two, they also knew that since people do not understand inflation, then they're really agreeing to work for a whole lot less money. Now, recently, this did... Was that clear? Absolutely, Lynette. You're doing a great job here describing this. Okay. Now, um, recently for um, an event that I did, I went back in as I, I was preparing for it, and I, I hadn't noticed this before, but what I noticed was that the central banks had removed uh, the a long-term store of value from the from the functions of money. Now, it's more honest because everybody knows if you try and save a dollar over time, that dollar is losing value. And when you have high inflation like we do right now, it's noticeable to the population, right? But what concerns me with this next iteration that they want to put in place, which is the central bank digital currencies, and, and I'll, I'll come back to this in a second, but the central bank digital currencies would actually eliminate, according to the IMF, the, Inter the International Monetary Fund, would eliminate even the short-term store of value because there are no limitations, their words, not mine, 
no limitations on how low they can push interest rates. So now you get your paycheck, it's deposited directly into your bank account and it immediately starts losing principal value because of those negative rates. And now money is down to two, count them, two functions from four, which is simply a tool of measure and a tool of barter. And this where gold is really it's centralized it's it's decentralized and it's invisible you hold it you own it outright it runs no counterparty risk and it has been proven a proven inflation hedge over time as well as protection in geopolitical storms which uh, we've got a lot of those now um but it gave the power to the population because if you did not like what the government was doing, you could simply walk into any bank with a $20 bill and pull out an ounce of gold. And then that would create restrictions around how much debt the government could grow. So the public really controlled the government in that way. That's the way you, you always vote with your purse, right? So that gave them control. With the inflation, and with the dollar bills, well, if you hold cash in your wallet at this point anyway, it's it's kind of invisible, right? Because there's no chips in it. So you can preserve your principal, not your purchasing power, right? That gets inflated away. But at least you can preserve your principal. Once we go into a CBDC, the central, oh, Sorry, let me let me step back for one more second. When when a central bank today, when a central bank makes a policy choice, it takes roughly 18 months of going through the system before they know that they got what they wanted. So all of the interest rate increases that they put in last year, we haven't felt the effects of them yet because it's still working its way through the system. Now, we go into a CBDC that is completely programmable without any privacy, right? So they can tell you how long how long the money is good for, where you can spend it, where you can't spend it. They can control how, you know, they can control every aspect of it. If they don't like something that you say, they can just push a button and cut you off. And the other part of it is when you have gold and silver, well, that's a hard asset, takes energy and labor to pull out of the ground. It's easier with cash and bills because they've got printing presses. You go into CBDCs, that's even easier because they just put push a button to create as much money as they want. And every time they do that in both, both of the fiat systems, because CBDCs are certainly still fiat, but both of the CBD systems, every time they create new money, the purchasing power value of the money that's already out there goes down. And we're basically, I mean, officially we're we're at three cents, but we're the only thing holding it together is public confidence. And they're still agreeing to work for the dollars and use them as your tool of barter. But remember, you vote with your purse. That's so right. if you buy stocks, that's a vote. If you buy physical gold and you take possession of it, that's a vote. Whatever you do, that's a vote. Man, where you put your wealth is definitely a vote on what you're doing. You know, where you spend your money is a vote. Absolutely. Let me ask you something on that. Just obviously, mm -hmm. this is going to be pretty speculative, but how do you think they're going to introduce this central bank digital currency to us? Mm -hmm. That's not, not very speculative because they already set up all the Fed Dow accounts. Uh, they already uh, let us know back in 2020 when they were doing all of this stimulus, how much easier it would be to push a button and immediately just people would have money just like that. And, you know, people are funny. They think there is such a thing as a free lunch, but that's not true. There's never there really is no such thing as a free lunch. So we have a big crisis brewing, no doubt about it. And we've been really kind of kept on edge, lurching from crisis to crisis to crisis, particularly since, what, 2019. But we've been in a perpetual state of war since 89. So everybody is already kind of 
a little uncertain about what's happening. So you bring in the next big crisis, which I don't think is too far away. Uh, and what they'll do is they will just push a button. Everybody already has their FedNow accounts. I don't care where you are in the country, even in rural areas through the post office. And you have money in there. That's how they're going to introduce it. Yeah. Do you think that... Um... That will be something as basic and simple for people to use, like a debit card? Yes, I do, because they want people to use it. Now, whether or not they reload it, that's the next question. And there have been a number of countries that have been trying to push this through. Um, look at Nigeria, right? They introduced it, but they only got a half a percent of the population to adopt it. And so now they're just taking all the cash away because that's a very cash heavy country. And they're just taking, they're demonetizing. So they're not actually taking it away, but they're saying it's no longer good. All of these big bills, which I think the largest was like two the equivalent of $2.16, not good anymore. So they're trying to force adoption. So yeah, I think, I think they're going to hope that we adopt it easily, but if we don't, then they'll do something to force that adoption. Mm -hmm. So like during the next crisis, this will be like their answer to the situation kind of thing. That's kind of how they introduce a lot of stuff to, to the system is during crisis situations is to, PSA. you know, Patriot effect or uh, what I, Patriot effect. That's really what it's Patriot act, you know, but uh, yeah, this yeah. is the, the kind of thing that we end up ha having to deal with on a lot of this stuff. So this uh, central bank digital currency, there's going to be a lot of pushback to it, I I would think. But at some point, it's eventually so. going to Yeah, I mean, I would think so, too, um, or I would hope so. Uh, I talk to a lot of people about, you know, central bank digital currencies just to see what they know about it. And hardly anybody knows anything about the idea of central bank digital currencies. They really don't even understand, like, the transition going from metal to fiat and then into this next digital aspect right. of things. It's going to be really difficult for the word to get out there, and I think that it's really important that people do understand what what is taking place right now. Yes. When it one of the worries, and this is this is something that I've like I've tried to address myself, like because I'm I'm you know me, Lena. I love silver. I am all over that stuff, and I love silver too. <laughs> yeah. And uh, people ask me, you know, it's like, well, what do you do? How do you deal with the silver, whatever? Well, I have a network that I work with. Like I can work for silver. I've traded for silver. I've, you know, worked around with it. What happens if they make central bank digital currency illegal to transfer to gold or silver? Is that a question? Have you, have you thought like, man, how do we deal with this kind of thing if we decide that we're going to try and abandon the idea of using that central bank digital currency? Well, let, let's let's look at how they handled it before, because history is the best predictor of the future. Right. And there's silver and gold and then there's silver and gold. So it depends. There are all different kinds, is my point. And in 33, you couldn't they took the gold away from the population in the 60s. They took the silver away from the population. But there were forms of it. That's why I only do collectibles, to be honest with you. Because remember, you know, mo most people say, oh, well, I don't want to pay that premium. But I had an experience when I was 10 years old at my uncle's house, who was a very high end antique dealer. And uh, my parents and I were at his house when he was my favorite uncle. And we were at his house one day and he goes, come here, I want to show you something. So he took us in the back bedroom and he had two tall floor safes. And he said, if anything should happen to me, Aunt Birdie would be well taken care of for the rest of her life. So I turned around to look and you couldn't fit one more $20 gold eagle in there when it was illegal to hold more than five ounces in any other way but the way that he was holding it because those were all pre-1933 gold coins. So my high recommendation is, is that you do what the elites those that can write the laws do for themselves. Now, some of those coins can go for like 
eight, 13 million dollars for a one ounce coin. Not many people can spend 13 million dollars for one ounce of gold. But you can get into the same category for a whole lot less, you know, couple three thousand. Forgive me on this because I don't really work in that area anymore. So I can't be more specific than that. So I want to be in the category of the guy that can spend $8 million or $15 million on an ounce of gold. Because in 33, when they were taking the bullion away from all of the public, they wrote in the loopholes so that those that are in the know and in power actually could continue not just to hold it legally, not just accumulate it legally, but use it in the normal marketplace legally and mm -hmm. without oversight. Right. Right. So that's a very interesting argument that not a lot of people bring up is that these particular coins, these collectible coins, basically step above what the gold laws were. Right. They're like, hey, we separate ourselves from what you're talking about down there with this monetary policy because we're a collectible item. And then in that fashion, everything's normal. Exactly. Right. So for me, I think the easiest way for the normal person to know is if you can hold it inside of an IRA, you don't want to buy it. Interesting. Say that again. If you can hold it inside of an IRA, which is so easy to confiscate, you don't want to buy it. Okay. Just for some of the viewers who might be young, an IRA, an individual retirement account, right? Yes. Yes. And so this is basically like your own ability to basically build up a stock portfolio or gold portfolio or whatever. That's like your retirement fund, but it's subject to confiscation, right? Well, it's absolutely subject to confiscation. And not only that, it's absolutely visible to the powers that be that can determine how you take that distribution. They can look at it and they can change those rules and laws, but you basically don't have any privacy in there at all. So I have a strong retirement account and I used to have an IRA, I had a SEP IRA. But I liquidated that and converted it into the collectible coins that I hold. Because regardless of your perception, this is so critical. Regardless of your perception, if you do not hold it, you do not own it. It is a contract. And anything that is a contract runs counterparty risk. You've got to know 100% that the person on the or the entity on the other side of that contract has the ability to live up to their word. Because if they can't and they don't, you're, pardon me, you're screwed. Right. It's and that's and that's really what it comes down to is that third party risk. That's the that was the main reason that got me into physical was that I wanted yeah. something that was away from everybody else, regardless of the phone app, regardless of the phone number, regardless of the location. Doesn't matter what happens out there. This is my my possession, my protection. You know, and that's uh, true anywhere you go in the world, Simon. Right, and and that's what I found. Like I mean, anywhere anywhere I've studied. Gold and silver are acceptable currencies. I mean, like you can't you can't find a place where they won't accept it. You know, it's exactly. like it, 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 and so you can find places where maybe different currencies aren't dollars pretty widely accepted, but everything everywhere, gold and silver is accepted. And you know, I think about like how many different languages uses silver for the same word as money. I mean, it's like you know, it's a synonymous thing. So yeah, there's no doubt about it. Um. You know, as far as like a gold confiscation, because this is another one, since you've studied a lot of the currencies, mm -hmm. you know, I hear people say, you know, a gold's confiscation if you hold on to the physical. Now, we talked a little bit about that if you hold the collectibles, but do you really think that that would be the case? I mean, if it was a gold confiscation, wouldn't that be like lending to the idea that we are moving back to a gold standard? Well, ultimately, history shows us that we will to a degree, but let's let so let's talk about that. Just kind of re ask me that. But let's talk about the gold confiscation because people, if they say if they say, oh, that can't happen again, 
Well, then that's just hopium that is not historic, right? Even currently, if you look at Ghana, they just instituted, a, it. now they don't call it confiscation, they call it a, a levy or a tax, or there are all sorts of different ways of, of a confiscation. But they are forcing every miner to deliver to the Ghana uh, Central Bank 20% of their production at the local currency, mm. which has lost, well, I don't know where it is right now, but the last time I checked was had lost 57% of its value, of its purchasing power value very rapidly. So there are all different kinds of confiscation that is happening right now. In 2016, and I know I'll get pushback on this, but, but this came from the um, Ministry of India. Uh, in 2016, when India denominated or demonetized 85% of its currency, like Nigeria just did, uh, they went door to door allowing a certain level because Indians particularly, or any country that's really gone through hyperinflation before, their public is very attuned to wearing their wealth. So, uh, but they went door to door, only allowing people to keep a certain level of gold and taking the rest. So we aren't talking about hundreds of years ago. We're talking about, you know, gosh, Ghana is, is happening right now, right? The same thing in Venezuela. They did a confiscation and, uh, and there's all different, again, there's all different ways to do a confiscation, maybe not call it a confiscation, but a rose by any other name. You know what I mean? Uh, so I think that somebody that feels that way, you know, maybe they're right and maybe they're wrong, but if I can do something that it doesn't matter whether I'm right or wrong, that's what I'm going to do because that little bit of a premium that I pay when I already know how undervalued gold and silver are, that's my wealth insurance. That's making sure that no matter what happens, I got my money covered and it's something I can use in the normal marketplace. Right. Which is for me, that's key because I can't execute the strategy if I can't use it freely. And that's and that's the that's the thing about it is like being able to operate without restrictions, you know, and that's and that's and if you do if you do have the restrictions to be able to understand what they are and to be able to operate, you know, at a different level that, you know, circumvents that it's, you know, it's a difficult operation. You know, things are getting tough. We we certainly see it. We know the inflation and times are getting hard. I still predict that there's going to be an issue with food production coming into the future oh. at some point. I oh, know 100%. that you, there already is. Yeah, there, it is. I know you're a major food or major prepper, right? I've seen I've seen the photographs. You do a <laughs> great job on your on your area. Um, you know, on your uh, how are you calling it? It's not you're not calling it a homestead. You call it something else. I forget. I call it well. You know, I have my urban <laughs> farm yeah, in, in the out. middle of dead central Phoenix, okay. uh, and then I have my bug out house, which I'm. Evolving that, I mean, we're almost done with the hot houses. That's been taking quite a long time, but I'm never daunted. Just keep moving forward. So, yeah, because food becomes the single biggest issue. We we deal with that on our other channel. I didn't really say this, but it's called Beyond Gold and Silver because my mantra is food, water, energy, security, barterability, wealth preservation, community, and shelter. Uh, and, you know, you can live with a lot of things, but you can't live without food and water. And and to your point, um, the world is getting hungrier and hungrier. Uh, you know, countries that were exporting are not exporting anymore. And the inflation, people can't afford the food. So world hunger is growing. And as we go through these transitions, unfortunately, Globally, on average, 80% of the population ends up in abject poverty. In Venezuela, 80%. they're at 90%. Abject poverty. It's incredible. You know, the the separation that happens from that new money pouring in, you know, it's just it, it's pretty apparent when it when he when you really start to study like the Cantillon effect and stuff. 
It's important that we do understand that, you know, the situation is going to get very tough for a lot of people and to prep yes. ourselves up for it. It's not just a matter of protecting our wealth, but doing like you're saying, you know, you know, finding that water source, finding that food source. But then I think probably one of the bigger things that I think a lot of people have taken for granted, especially le lately, is the networking, right? To make sure that if you don't have a particular skill to find yeah. something or find somebody out there that does have that skill that you can trade with, you know, maybe you have a different type of skill or something else that you can trade with. And that's also important. Like you may never, you know, you may never need that skill, but it is to have that network and that team, you know, in place is, is going to be really important to go into the future. Um, do you have any other advice or any, you know, kind of input that would you like to share with the audience? And Well, one of the other things that I'd really like to bring out because people don't realize this, but you know, over time, starting in the early, well, in the early 70s, when we went off the gold standard, we began to financialize the system. In other words, Wall Street, people are should not be shocked anymore that it should be obvious that Wall Street is far more important than Main Street. And a huge issue that's coming up that I hear virtually nobody talking about, but in 2020, uh, I mean, all, all of whether it's food or it's energy or now water, real estate has actually been turned into a trading prof, uh, product for Wall Street. So we are so far away from a true supply demand market. It's ridiculous. And people don't realize. So the look at the tickers on, well, this is how much gold is worth. This is how much. And now water is worth. But remember when we went to negative $35 a barrel on oil? Was that really because of supply and demand or was that trading? The banks, yeah. and the banks, whether they're commercial banks or investment banks, they are all about trading for a profit. They don't care about true supply and demand and they definitely don't care about us. They're just about a little pickup in money. And so it makes it critically important, critically important that you are secure in that whole mantra sphere. And I'm going to say that I put medicine at the level of food. Okay. So you want to make sure that you are secure in that and that maybe you can have enough to share. So if you look at what happened in April, March, April, May of 2020, when the grocery store shelves went bare, how did you feel? How did that impact you? Where were the holes in what you do? I mean, I had Jacqueline call me up. She says she wasn't frantic. I'm telling you, she was frantic because she didn't have toilet paper. I said, don't worry. I have lots of toilet paper that I can give you. But because I was prepared, you know, I was walking around my gardens going, I'm in good shape. I mean, I have fish, I have ducks. I just had crawfish for the first time from oh, my good. pond. I did. It was fabulous last Friday. Um, but, you know, what if I'm, again, what if I'm right and what if I'm wrong? All right. If I'm right, thank goodness I've done all this preparation because I cannot just, I'm preparing for 40 people at my bug out location. So I can support 40 people there. But let's say I'm wrong. Well, if I'm wrong, then I have a, I have lots of wonderful food and all of the wonderful amenities that I've created in dead central Phoenix. But I also have a great vacation house, right? For my family, for friends, I can even lease it out and generate income if I want. So it doesn't matter if I'm right or if I'm wrong. So why not do those things? Because these are the things that we all need to sustain a reasonable standard of living. But again, you want to take advantage of it. So I would say that most people don't understand, but I think that this is critically important for everybody to understand the true value or the fundamental value of an asset or an instrument, because that is the only way that the individual can know if something's overvalued, fairly valued or undervalued. Therefore, do I wanna buy it? Do I wanna hold it? Do I wanna liquidate it? And I can tell you absolutely and for a fact and show you lots and lots and lots of examples 
that uh, gold, you know, a rising gold price is an indication of a failing currency. And so with Wall Street's help, central banks can easily suppress the price of gold and silver so that we don't understand that the currency and the system is failing. But when everybody, this is a con game. So when the public loses confidence and every other layer of confidence above us is gone, bank to bank, central bank to central bank. Last August, it was Wall Street to central banks. The only level of confidence that yet remains is the public confidence. When that is lost, that's when we will enter the really rapid rate of hyperinflation. And when, and that's also when you will see the overnight revaluations of gold, because gold is the primary currency metal, and it will express or begin to express toward its true fundamental value. So just recently, as example, we saw, uh, I think it was, Nigeria that, no, they demonetized. What's the other one? Lebanon. Lebanon did an overnight revaluation recently. And so their spot went up more than 1300% just overnight, right? Now, has it fully expressed to its true fundamental value in terms of how much money they had printed prior? No, not yet, but that's the first step. And they usually do that on average, three times, though Venezuela is on number four. And that happened in October. So, you know, take heed because what we're seeing is this is happening a lot in the um, emerging markets where those revaluations and the hyperinflation and the breakdown is occurring, but coming to a theater near you. Use that as the canary in the coal mine and get ready and get ready now because we have a lot of stuff coming up this year, 2023, and we don't even have time to go into it. But, you know, we have a lot of stuff that's coming up. My bet is we're going to experience a big, huge black swan crisis. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll put my neck on the line and understand I could be wrong. But I think it'll happen before June 30th because of the live or so for switch, which is supposed to be completed by then. Okay. And well, let's let's, let's talk about that real briefly. This and then because I know you got, I know I'm taking up a lot of your time here, but I know it's I okay because people are going to be like, "Whoa, what's that?" Okay. Well, you, yeah. <laughs> you know, don't leave us hanging at thir June 30th live or what's that made? Okay. So just kind of briefly, got to talk about that, and we'll kind of we'll kind of end it up there on that one because that's a that's a great topic. Oh, my God. It's it's you know, nobody's really talking about it. And it, it, this hysterically has never, ever, 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 ever been attempted. And, you know, these guys are so brilliant and so smart. Sure, they can pull this off. But what happened is LIBOR, which is a London interbank offer rate, is an interest rate benchmark that was created in the 80s and embedded in every single contract that there is. So whether it's your mortgage or your credit card, you know, or your car loan or your student loan or derivatives, which are big leverage bets, this interest rate has been embedded, but it was discovered in um, during the great financial crisis, which is really when the system died, that this was just a stated rate. So you had a handful of banks that get together every morning and go, Gee, if I were going to loan you money overnight, this is how much I would charge you. And if I was going to borrow money overnight, this is how much I would be willing to pay. And, you know, shockingly, and I hope you get I'm being completely facetious, it was discovered that traders were manipulating that rate. Oh, my goodness. What a shock. And so uh, then the Bank of England came out and said, OK, we are going to end that rate. We have to come up with a new benchmark. And there were a handful of countries that did that. In the US, that new benchmark is called SOFR. And so you've got the last, the last count that I saw, you have an additional $610 trillion in notional value contracts that still had to convert to the new benchmark. OK, and they had to force compliance uh, as of January 1st of 2022. No new contracts 
could have LIBOR embedded in them. So they had to force compliance because Wall Street, the new benchmark does not work the same as the old benchmark. So they did their little accounting gimmicks on it and they still cannot get the new benchmark to be the same as the old benchmark. Now, why does this matter? Because contracts valuation, so in corporations and banks, are valued based upon that interest rate benchmark. And so it may not matter for one contract, but if you're looking at 600 trillion contracts, that is a tectonic valuation shift in the global banking system. That's huge. Yay. Now, can they pull it off? Could I be completely wrong to be so concerned about it? M maybe. I mean, you know, okay, so, who knows? So this, is, so this is going to happen June 30th, you said? Yes. Okay. So they on they June... ran a test in October of 2020 on 80 trillion. And it was, and this was supposed to happen, or was it 2019? It was one or the other. This was originally supposed to happen in 2021. They ran that test with 80 trillion and it was a big fat fail. And I knew that it was a big fat fail because after they ran the test, it went dead silent. And then three weeks later, they postponed it until June 30th of 2023. So I don't know, maybe they can pull this off, but I don't think they can. So I think there's, I mean, look at, are we moving to World War III? Sides are being, you know, sides are being divvied up right now. So yeah, I think I think there'll be a crisis before that to mask the fact that I, that they can't make this transition. Yeah, well, Lena, this is this is a good one. I'm glad we had this. It's going to give me something to think about here because this is going to be a big one. Like I'm trying to wrap my head around what this transition can look like on June 30th when this takes place. Because basically, all these contracts need to be valued at this new interest rate or Correct. this. Other interest rate maybe not necessarily a new one but but it's a different one so if it's not the same then there's going to be there's going to be issues i mean no matter right. what and so and they've been you know they've been transitioning contracts over to it but in some cases you have to get everybody to agree and the area that is most problematic for them it's not the mortgages and all that cuz the language for them to do whatever they want is in there and they put in place uh stopgap measures so that if you or I open our mortgage statement or student loan or auto loan or whatever and all of a sudden we owe a lot more money than we thought we did well you can't sue anybody you're just screwed mm -hmm. but um, you know, in, in 2008, the freezing of the CDO market, so collateralized debt obligation, collapsed the system. What rose up from that are CLOs, collateralized loan obligations, and um, they're not liking this because they're getting less money in from the change, and so they're actually fighting it, and that's a huge market. So, we're, we're going to see what happens, but I think we're probably going to see, and I, I, you know, I mean, I could kill my career because I keep talking about this, but what nobody is else is talking about it. Uh, Why not? You just, Why aren't they talking you know, about it? So we're talking the CLOs are having a hard time dealing with this transferring over by the Oh, yeah. <laughs> I wish we could talk all afternoon, Lynette. I know I've taken so much of your time. Thank you so much for coming out here. The last five minutes have just been absolutely incredible. It's got me thinking here. Really appreciate your time. Please tell our audience, how can they find you on the internet? Obviously, it's pretty easy to find Lynette Zhang, but let us know, where are, where are you at? What, what, where can we find you? Well, you know, I have a pretty active YouTube channel, so you can also go in there and search me. We have Beyond Gold and Silver and itmtrading.com. Mm -hmm. And uh, just to let you know, I am a personal customer of ITM Trading, uh, own gold. Oh, I didn't know that. Good. Uh, yes. Yep. Uh, my mom, actually, she was uh, she was the one who purchased, uh, made the purchase for us. Uh, for the whole family so uh she gave me a handful of dimes that we got from from itm trading and uh, a beautiful gold coin as well so excellent uh, good mom yeah so yeah thank you mom yeah very much so um lynette thank you so much for taking the time today
Simon, any time at all, any time. I really appreciate it. Have a great afternoon. You too. Bye-bye. All right. Uneducated economists, you guys let us know.